The Lemonster Historical Society is pleased to present local Lemonster historian and author Mark Bonanza introducing his latest book Risk Takers and History Makers The History of Lemonster Thank you very much for coming everyone uh, my name is Mark Bonanza I'm one of the trustees of the Historical Society and it's always good to do a program here and um, the uh, Society asked me to present my new book and I'm more than happy to do it so last November I was uh, toying with an idea for something to write and um, over the last decade as I've written one book and the next a lot of times people will ask well what's, what's next? What's your next project are you going to write about? And usually I have two or three different books that I'm thinking about writing and the one that I was going to write wasn't quite ready to write yet and when it starts getting cold at this time of year I like to write and during the summer I like to read. And last um, November I was in the Barnes & Noble store here in Lannister looking around sort of really impressed by the number of books that are published each year. Uh, people told us when we built the library 12 years ago that books were going out of style. But it um, turns out that over the last 20 years, the number of books that are published has actually gone up fourfold. Uh, over a million books a year are published in the United States. So I asked myself, what are all these people writing about? Why? Well, some of the obvious answers are that people write to inform, people write to entertain. But the other thing I think people write for is legacy. And I thought about that for a moment. I said, what could I write that somebody would actually read in 200 years from now? Mm -hmm. So I thought about writing the history of Lunaster. And I had toyed with that idea for a while. And I knew it was going to be a significant undertaking. And I finally, last November, or November 30th to be exact, committed to the idea of writing the story of Lunaster. Um, one of my great resources in writing Lundestick's history was another history of Lundestick that was written in really the only true book approaching um, a history of Lundestick was David Wilder's book in 1852. So it's been a long time since there's been an update. And when I read the preface to the, uh, David Wilder's book, which he commenced on December 3rd of 1851, he wanted God's uh, providence and blessings to be able to complete the work. And he, a year later, on December 3rd, 1852, he thanked God for keeping him alive and for getting the book uh, to be finished. And he published it. And we're indebted because there's a lot of information in that book that, of course, if he had written it down, it would probably have been lost. Uh, so I think back to that, and I you know, wonder about what it was like in his time. And how that book that got off the ground was kind of interesting. In 1850, 1851, there was a lot of stuff going on in this town. And one of the things that happened in 1851 is they built a new town hall. Um, the common was changing. And the new town hall that was built in 1851, or dedicated in 1851, was with a parking lot between the Baptist and the Unitarian churches are today. And some of us may remember that building because the police station was in there before they opened the 1959 structure. And it was used even after the new police station, not new anymore, but the antiquated police station, the 1959 building was opened. Um, I'm told, I think, that people, I'm too young to remember this, but it was like sort of the public bathrooms when you were downtown doing the shopping. And, um, that building was actually dedicated on November 7th, 1851. And they asked David Wilde to give an address about Lunister history. So he did, and he gave a, a review of what Lunister history was to that point. And they published it in a pamphlet. Um, and as they often did when people gave speeches back in those days, it was kind of a way to honor them for doing the speech. And he got a lot of praise for the, for the speech. And people encouraged him to write the history of Lunister, which is what got him to start it um, less than a month later. So I had the same kind of experience. It was like, why am I doing this? Like, this could be anybody, truly. 
And I started it, and you know, I dug into it pretty deeply, and I became obsessed. Uh, I wanted to get it done, and I had those same kind of feelings that he did. And four months later, 145,000 words written, I finished it. Now, writing a history of 279 years it requires a tremendous amount of editorial judgment. There's a lot of things that can be included and excluded. And, you know, this thing could have been 10 volumes if I wanted it to be, but if I wrote a 10 volume history of Monster, I dare say no one would read it. Uh, so I wanted to make it accessible to people. So if someone could sit down and, you know, within a reasonable period of time, get sort of an idea of what the city's all about. So, you know, it, it's interesting to not only write the history, but to appreciate what other people thought a hundred or more years ago about Monistus history. And one of the more interesting things I found when I was researching this book is David Wilder writes about our first brother, which actually is a very interesting story. Because, of course, back in those days, you had to have a godly minister if you were going to have a town. So by the time they, they got their fields cleared and they got their government organized, in 1741, they finally set about to building a meeting house. And that first meeting house was built in 1743 in front of what is now the Pine Grove Cemetery. At that time, that was the center of town because, of course, that's where your meeting house was. So they hired a guy named John Rogers to be Lemison's first minister. And everything went along pretty well for a little while until John Rogers got the idea through his studies that Jesus Christ really wasn't a deity, but just a prophet, you know, a good guy. And this, of course, was the beginnings of Unitarianism, but he was way ahead of his time. And most of the people in the town were not very impressed by his knowledge of Christ, and they decided to fire him. And then he did, even then, what was the American thing to do? He sued. And went to the Superior Court, and he actually won. <coughs> And what the, well, I'll say this. They entered into a settlement. And the settlement agreement was he got to have his precinct, and the rest of the town got to have their precinct, and this is how North Lumbus was created. So in 1762, the parsonage, uh, which still stands, and John Rogers was established in North Lumbus District, and the people that followed him went to his church, and Francis Gardner, uh, who became Lumbus's second minister, established his church um, here um, where Pine Grove is and then a little bit later in 1774 the center of town was moved to what we know today. They kind of coexisted okay, they got along reasonably well, they both had their um, following and by 1788 people reunited Lemister on the one minister who was of course Francis Geiger. Now, people like to think that, you know, when we went to school and we were taught that people came here for religious freedom, that's a lot of book, okay? People came here for religious intoleration. People came here to establish their religion and to practice it their way, which wasn't, of course, being permitted in Europe, notably England. So, church and state don't actually separate in Massachusetts until 1835. The congregational religion was tax supported here and other places until that year. In 1823, Lemister finally figured out what was coming. And the second meeting house, which was on the common, right across from where Subway is today, um, was taken down. And its pieces were rebuilt to where, to, uh, into a structure called Garment Hall, which was located where City Hall is today. And, um, they established a new church where the Unitarian Church is today. That building was built in 1823 and lasted until 1904 until it burned to the ground. So when you look at the cover of my book, you're going to see all these white steeples. Because back in those days, this picture, by the way, was taken in 1865, um, all those churches are gone. They're all, they all burned down and were replaced by the structures at some point or other that we know today. Now, in 1843, in that third meeting house, which is that wood frame structure that was destroyed by fire, um, the Reverend at the time gave a review of Lemister's first hundred years as a body politic and as a church. Now, one of the fascinating things about that 
is when you read David Wilde's history, you learn that John Rogers, that sort of maverick minister that started it all, was a descendant of the martyr John Rogers, who was the first person killed by Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, back in the 16th century, no, sorry, uh, 15th century. And it turns out that, wow, how fascinating is this? Maybe that's why John Rogers was the maverick he was. The, the martyr John Rogers was given a chance to live, and he cheerfully went, they claim, to be burned at the stake, rather than give up his views. So, for many years, I believe that there was this fascinating connection between John Rogers, the martyr, and John Rogers, our first minister, until in the research for this book, I found an article written by a guy named Reverend George Bodge. And what Bodge says is that the Reverend and Lennister in 1843 um, made up the whole story. He actually wrote a letter that he ascribed to John Rogers that, of course, he wrote, not John Rogers, and this was all a fantasy to spice up his 1843 address. So those, those are some of the fascinating things you learn when you research history. I, I thought that was just incredible, incredibly amazing. Um, when Wilder wrote his book, Bodge says that was already known, and apparently Wilder's research never really got that far into it. So, not to be critical of, of, of um, David Wilder, but you know, we look at things differently today. History is not a static process. History is dynamic. It changes year to year. And you know, one of the things that early Lenester citizens took great pride in is that they bought the land from the Native Americans rather than take it by force. And I said, well, that's, you know, when I first read Wilder, I said, yeah, that's interesting. That's a nice thing. It's something that Lenester citizens can be proud of. Until I took the deal apart. So you look at this deal, okay, and they say that they bought the, the money they paid, they claim they had previously paid monies to a guy that doesn't show up anywhere in the record, a Native American, but no one knows who it was. They claim they paid him a certain sum. Then they agreed to pay an additional amount of money to the current Native Americans once they, they, they put down a small amount and they, the vast amount of balance was like a mortgage, and it was to be paid when George Tejanto, the Indian Sacrum, surveyed the land and got it approved by the general court. And he gave him four months to do it. Well, guess what? It never got done. In fact, it took 10 years to do it. And the Native Americans didn't do it. The colonists did it. The uh, proprietors of Lemister did it at that time in Lancaster. So do you think George Tejanto ever got his money? <laughs> so, so I wonder how much money the Native Americans really got. So people in Lemister are a little bit more sophisticated than just using brute force. They use finance and contracts uh, to get the land up away from the Native Americans. So there's a whole host of things that I had the pleasure to sort of re-examine, take a different look at. Um, we're in an interesting place. I was laboring for a title for the book and uh, came to talk to my brother. He's the one who actually coined the title Risk Takers and History Makers. And it kind of fits because we have a long history in this community of people that took a lot of chances. Um, could be the abolitionist Francis Drake who had the audacity to champion women's rights when that was more radical than freeing slaves. It could be Bernard Doyle who put together a company to make early plastic compounds and came up with the fantastic idea that making the compounds themselves rather than the products seemed like a better business. It could be Sam Foster, who you know, um, a guy named Jack Goodman took a chance on. Um, the Foster Grant story is, is a tremendous story by itself, fascinating story. Um, Sam Foster goes into um, the cellular business, like a lot of people in Lunister, uh, back in the late 19th century. And a company called SS Kirish, uh, Kmart, um, was making dye with rhinestones in it. And they found out that using bone or horn, which is typically what's used to make dice, uh, was not a very good material to try to drill holes into it and put rhinestones. They found out celluloid was a much better material. So <clears throat> Jack Woodman, who was marking this stuff for Kmart, came here and tried to find a manufacturer. 
the Viscoloid Company, which was owned by Doyle. Uh, Doyle not only made compound, but of course he manufactured products as well, was too busy and everybody else was busy. And he was ready to give up and go back to New York. And he looked down this little lane, which was Manning Avenue, saw this little shack that said Foster Grant. He said, let's try it. So he walked down the street, met Sam Foster about 9 o'clock at night, and they didn't break up until 3 o'clock in the morning. They made a deal, and they shook hands, and Goodman calculated how much a deposit should be for the job that he ordered. And Sam Foster said, well, I, I don't need any money. I don't need a deposit. And Goodman kind of looked at him and scowled. Like, what kind of businessman are you? And Sam Foster said back to him, I can trust you, right, Jack? You would know that best. And they had a pretty good laugh over that, and uh, they started manufacturing for the Gooding Company, which, by the way, still exists. And I had the pleasure of talking about these stories with one of their descendants. Um, anybody know how Foster Grant got its name, its second name? One guy does, because I told him. Okay. Anybody know why it's Foster Grant? Who was Grant? Anybody know? Ulysses S. Grant? No. Grant was a guy from Providence, Rhode Island, who was a salesman. And he came along, and of course, Sam Foster was trying to grow his company, and any good plastic company needs a sales force. And he wanted to hire Grant to sell. But Grant wanted a piece of the action. He didn't want to just be a contract agent. He wanted to have a piece of the pie. So Sam Foster agreed, and about six months into the relationship, things weren't working out. So he ended up buying the share back from Mr. Grant, William Grant, and they didn't have enough money to change the name. So they left it. <laughs> so for all, these, for all those years after it, it's known as Foster Grant for a guy that was involved in the company for literally less than a year. Um, so a lot of fascinating stories in this community uh, like that. And um, you know, some of them from the files that you can't make it up. Um, one of the most, um, before I take some questions, one of the stories I'll leave you with that I kind of thought was cool. I can re remember as a young person growing up, sort of the uh, famous or infamous story of Valerie Bogan, who was a Lumbister resident that had the unfortunate uh, experience of putting, patching the back of his jeans with an American flag. And um, he got arrested for doing that. Um, back in those days, the heady days of the Vietnam War and the generation gap and uh, hippies and all that sort of thing, there were a lot of people hanging around downtown. And the older generation didn't really want to see that. So they put a lot of pressure on the police department to get those hippies off the street. And of course, the hippies liked hanging around downtown, so there was a little bit of friction. And Valerie had long hair, so I guess he was a hippie. And, you know, he uh, was an immigrant from Canada and went to Lumbister High School, Saxon Trade. And he graduated and went to work at Union Products, of course, who made the pink flamingo. And he was spray painting chickens for 82 bucks a week. And a little bored, and then the furthest west he'd ever been was Gardner. And he decided, I'm going to see the country, discover America, right? So he hitchhiked his way out to California and worked on an underground, uh, underground uh, I got evolution on my mind, an underground restaurant out there. And uh, of course, the culture in California was a lot different than it was in Lumbister. And people were wearing flags on their clothing uh, out in California. So while he was there, he saw a flag that that was half buried in the dirt, and pulled it out, and cleaned it up, and decided to keep it. And he came back to Lumbister for the holidays. And he was hanging around downtown, and there was a little jaw jacking back and forth between his group and the police. And apparently that didn't set very well with the police, so they went back to the station. Someone must have did their homework. And they found out that there was a statute against desecrating the flag. And they determined that wearing a flag on your rear end of your pants is desecration of the flag. So he, he visited some friends in Boston. They came home, and his parents said, hey, the police have been here looking for you. You better get on the station and see what they want. So he went to the station, said, hey, I'm Valerie Bogan. I'm here. I hear you're looking for me. And no words were exchanged. The cop that was at the desk leaped over the desk, no glass in those days, and tackled him, and handcuffed him, and arrested him for desecrating the flag. He ends up and the Lemister District Court in front of Richard Comfort, who was the judge at the time, he knew him well. And what I can tell you about um, Judge Comfort, great guy, but I can tell you that he was in the service, his wife was in the service, and his son, I think, was flying jets at the time in Vietnam. 
So he didn't have any sense of humor for Mr. Bogan's attire, and he gave him the maximum sentence that you could get for this creating the flag one year in jail. So he gets trucked off to the Worcester County House of Correction. Back in those days, you could appeal to the Superior Court for a jury trial. He went to the Superior Court, he was convicted again, this time he got a six-month sentence, instead of a year sentence from Judge Ian Garbers. Then every public interest lawyer in the New England and beyond wanted his case. And he was literally interviewing law firms and lawyers in the House of Correction, and finally settled on one couple of lawyers who sounded pretty confident. And they filed a writ of habeas corpus in the U.S. District Court in Boston, and were successful in getting him released. Commonwealth of Massachusetts appealed to the Circuit Court of Appeals, the second highest court in the country. They affirmed the lower court. And then the Massachusetts filed for a writ of certiorari with the Supreme Court of the United States, of course, the highest court in the land. The Supreme Court, court granted certiorari, and there was Valerie Bogan before the U.S. Supreme Court. And in a six to three decision, the Supreme Court affirmed the lower courts, and he remained a free man. Interestingly enough, Judge Rehnquist wrote the opinion for the dissent and started with Lexington and Concord and did a nice review of American history, how important the flag was, and this guy should end up in jail. And fortunately for Valerie, he was uh, in the minority of the court. Now, the mayor was also fascinated by, always fascinated by this story, and he kind of was looking for Valerie Bogan. He wanted to meet him. And Valerie Bogan was actually hiding in plain sight right here in Huntsville. No one, no one knew where he was. Now, you can kind of understand this because when this case happened, he wasn't popular with everybody. And some people had a problem with this um, and looked at it a different way than we might look at it today, especially. And uh, so he kind of didn't, you know, he shunned the public limelight. I am told by the library that the Smithsonian actually called looking for him because they wanted to see if he still had the genes. They wanted to put him in a small, <laughs> small Smithsonian Institute. Um, his daughter came home from school one day with a, text, a high school textbook, history textbook, opened it up to an article and said, Dad, is this you? And he was actually in the history book. I found him from Facebook. I was actually friends with his wife on Facebook. And he was a little reluctant at first to come and talk to me, but he came and we had a good conversation and uh, I told the story and I think he likes the way I told it. But it's just another one of those fascinating things that's happened in this community like all communities have stories, that, that's really one that's uh, an interesting one. Um, at this point, I would, I'm interested in what you are interested in. Does anybody have questions for me? Yes? I'm not going to on the yep. topic for you, but where was Pine Grove Cemetery? Still exists. It's the original, well, not the original, original burial ground. Sort of the original burial ground. When you drive, um, if you drive down Route um, 12, and you get to come to the junction of Route 13, and you're about to take a right there, right, right across from just a little bit down from St. Louis Church. Okay. And you look to your right hand side, back in, back in what a, back in what used to be the railroad, railroad tracks, there's a burial ground there. That was Pine Grove Cemetery, or is Pine Grove Cemetery. Okay. Now, obviously, the very first burial place was the Wilson Farm, which is up off of the junction of Day Street and Main Street. It's gone. They just obliterated the place. I don't know, no one knows how many graves were there, but there's a historical society marker that was placed there many years ago to note the fact that that was actually Lemus's first place where people were buried. Anybody else? Mark, the, reading the book, the North, North Lemus area, is yeah. pretty prominent, and, I, and it kind of surprised me, you know, because of the distance between the, 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 the center, center and up there. That church was very prominent, right? Yeah, I mean, he had a lot of adherents. Some of the money people in the community followed him. I neglected to tell you that the parsonage still stands. It, it's near the intersection of Pierce and Maine. So if you were standing, if you were coming out of Pierce Street to enter Maine, you looked across the road, you'd be looking at the parsonage. It may be slightly to the right. It's a set of a sea green apartment building. That was uh, Reverend oh. Rogers' parsonage. And, you know, no, 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 no had a prominent place in our history, not just because of that, but when the rail came, of course, what they were connected was Fitchburg. Because by that time, you know, Fitchburg was sort of taking over, if you will, in terms of the industrial development because of water power. Um, but the rail went through North Lundestown. 
So it did come close to the center of Lemister when it, when it was first established. So what was had significance because of that as well. But interestingly enough, the paper industry didn't start in Fitchburg, it started here. Samuel Crocker, everybody's heard of the Crocker family. Mm -hmm. Samuel Clark Crocker was a deacon, and he was not originally from Lemister, but he lived in Lemister when Jonas Kendall hired him to work as a batman. Now, that man was a person who stuck their hands into a mush of molten paper and water, pulled out the paper pulp, put it onto a screen, squeezed out the water, and created a sheet of paper. So they could always tell the that man because their hands were perpetually red from being chafed, being in water. Now, a that man back in the days when Samuel Crocker was hired got five bucks a week, but they paid Crocker five fifty because he didn't drink. So he was more efficient. So they, they felt he was worth it. Now his son, Alva Crocker, of course, ended up taking the paper business to Fitchburg. Uh, but the paper business actually, the paper industry, really got it started last time. Do you think they moved the paper business to Fitchburg because of the rivers? Yes, the power. Yeah, the power. <laughs> the, the natural river drops three, three or four hundred feet within the boundaries of Fitchburg. So obviously back then, water power was critical to, to industry. So that's how Fitchburg really served sort of surpasses Lumister eventually because of that river. Anyone else? Somebody else wants to have a question? Yes? Where it's been so long since anybody has um, put in writing the history of Lumister since the 1850s. I know you couldn't get everything in one book of there. Do you have research put aside? Say on other parts of history that might be used. Since I wrote this book, yeah. uh, Steve and I, Steve Ledger, who's a, a board member of the Historical Society, found this wonderful. Steve found this book, and we were we were admiring it one day, and we were trying to figure out who took it. Okay, so one of the resources we have now, people really started getting into the history in the late 1880, 1890. History started to become a thing in the United States generally. And that was true here too. And one of the people we're indebted to here at the Historical Society, one of its founding members, was a guy named E.G. Davis, who was a photographer. And he started, he was apprenticed to a guy named Orrin Buck. And he started his own photography business when Buck died around 1870 and started taking photos of everything, you know, people, places, and his glass negatives reproduced with incredible clarity. It is one of our greatest resources. He took pictures till 1913. Now, we don't know a single photo um, that Warren Buck took. And Steve and I were wondering if this was a Buck photo. Um, and it's a fascinating photo because it shows Lemister at a time, um, you know, where just, you know, right around the time or just after the Civil War, so as I, as I mentioned in my talk earlier, you can see those white steeples on the spine. Then you can see the Rockwell Mill on the back cover of the cover, and it's covered with scaffolding. So it's being constructed. So doing the homework, one of these churches burned in 1872, so we know, so that couldn't have been there. When this, it had, the photo had to be before 1872. The mill changed hands in 1865, and they improved it, but we don't know when, exactly when the improvement work was done. So best we could do at the time was to figure out it was someplace between 1865 and 1870, say. Well, since then, right, again, hiding in plain sight, we found this picture of another resource. And it was actually taken by a guy named William T. Allen in 1865. So there's always something to learn. And as I said earlier, it's not a static process, it's dynamic. And you know, having the responsibility of being the editor, so to speak, is, it was a little daunting, I must admit. I'm going to tell you that uh, I agonized, maybe too strong of a word, but I really deliberated what to put in here and what not to. And um, I'm not a salacious writer. There's some things that happened to us that weren't really great. Um, and I left out names um, for respect of victims and family members and things like that. So, you know. I, I don't know if it'll be me. I, I, I hope not. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm going to tell you, this took, this took a toll on me, physically. Like, back hurt after I was done writing this book. Um, I just found myself at a torrid pace. So, all, when I was almost done, I was thinking about this very topic. Like, what do you put in here? You know, 
I wrote this paragraph, and this is near the end of the book. Before I turn off the light, I apologize to anyone I've missed and to the families and friends of any omitted deceased. The oversight was not the product of callous indifference, but only exhaustion and human limits. This is one record for one time. I hope the mantle will be taken up by others to expand this work someday, just as I have done, especially with David Wilder's 19th century book. I will candidly admit that this has been a significant effort, greater than I would have believed before I set out. 279 years is a long time. Lundestad has had quite a ride. I will leave it to others to write future histories, replete with happenings we have yet to imagine. Thomas Jefferson said, I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. With deference to the draftsman of our nation's birth certificate, I'm going to side with Dr. Seuss on this one. <laughs> they say I'm old fashioned and live in the past, but sometimes I think progress progresses too fast. <laughs> that's, so that, that's my philosophy on what happens in the future. <laughs> Any other questions before we. Are there any uh, follow up? Any more books? Any plans for the future? Uh, I'm actually, to, uh, my next book, which I probably will start very soon, is going to be about Flight 847, which was hijacked uh, from, on its way from Athens to Rome in 1984. And I happen to know one of the people that was on that were on that flight, and um, he was born in Berlin and spoke fluent German, as did the Palestinian hijackers, which gave him a very unique perspective of that whole incident. And some may remember that that flight was actually flown to Beirut. At one point, he was taken off the plane uh, by the hijackers and shown things in Beirut. In Beirut, um, they were actually trying to use him to get their point across as to why they did what they did. Um, so I, I think it's going to be an interesting story and an excited uh, little divergence from Lummis to history for a while. I kind of come back and forth uh, from Lummis to stories to stories that aren't uh, about Lummis, so I think that's the next project. project. Is that fellow by chance the one that owned North End and Plano up on the Mass Ave? That's, yeah, no, I know yeah. a lot of fellow, yeah. Yeah, he's got, quite a, he's got some stories to tell. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, I, I really appreciate you coming. Uh, I, Bob always tells me to keep it short and sweet. I, I'm, reminded of the, I'm reminded of the story of uh, Edward Everett. Does anybody know who Edward, Edward Everett was? Yeah. Edward Everett spoke at Gettysburg. He was the featured speaker at Gettysburg. He, he spoke for two hours. Lincoln spoke for two minutes. And after Lincoln was done, Edward said that Lincoln you got to the heart of it in, uh, in two minutes, I couldn't get through in two hours. <laughs> so I'm always, when I tell people, we have a Hall of Fame, football Hall of Fame we do every year, and um, Hall of Fame inductees can get pretty nostalgic and sentimental, and they, believe me, they can talk for a long time. And I always tell people, you know, we don't have a band to stop playing, so I always tell people the story of that whatever. You know, be like Lincoln, don't be like Lincoln. <laughs> Well, I'll say if anybody has anything further, thank you very much for coming. If you want to come up and ask me questions that you know me, I'd be happy to answer those. Um, sign a book for you, whatever you like. Thank you very much. Yes, there are refreshments in the lobby. Help yourself, these nice ladies from the society. We'll take good care of you.